The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter diamond Titus, and joining me here today, it's a bit meta because we've got a host being a guest again, so please excuse us if there's just lots of gibber today. We both could talk under a foot of wet cement, but he, 20 years ago, this gentleman worked in Comsec as a client services offer, and we've got a, sh- a shared little moment of background there. Since then, has been an advisor, he's run an AFSL, but now coaches and invests in financial planning businesses at the Wealth Network. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Dean Holmes. Woo! Welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you. I love the the clap of one. Uh, obviously, Kieran can put in a bigger clap uh, in post production. Uh, exactly. And both being podcasters at Ensemble, we know about Kieran and post production. Exactly. And for the listener, look, Kieran is our podcast producer and the general genius behind all the little tricks that go on from the somewhat uh, duller and more <laughs> plain thing that he gets from us as the file, and then he works his magic. So please give Kieran a big thumbs up in your head. Um, he does a lot of hard work to make us all sound much better than I think we actually sound. So, all right. So we're going to dive into Microsoft further today. Previously, uh, we I have, have have had a guest on the show and we covered Excel, you know, and Word specifically. But as you pointed out to me after that episode, Peter, there is so much more to Microsoft. And so I was really excited to get you on to chat through that. But as all the listeners know, we always start by getting to know you better through your use of technology. So, young man, what is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I do, I do do use emojis. So the, the most used one uh, is in context of most probably WhatsApp, which is the one where you stick the up, the thumbs up emoji on top of an existing message right. or post. So yes. I, I, it's my read receipt essentially of all the communication that often happens between myself and my wife and my friends is that if you've read it, you do a little thumbs up emoji so you know what's going on. So that's probably nice. the most used one. The one I love using the most just in terms of conversation is that little head with the explosion off the top of it yes. um, because I just like the idea of thought leadership and just new ideas. And so the more that I get to use that thumb, that head exploding Mind emoji, yep. Um, yep. In my context, anyway, that's that's being surprised and excited. I have no idea what the emoji organization um, determined what that was actually for. <laughs> And that's actually some of the danger with this stuff, right, is people like us in our generation are using these emojis. And in fact, to younger generations, they mean something entirely different. Correct. There's I'm a, a different bit wary of that. for that. <laughs> yes. I think I feel like we need to do like Gen X is out there a bit of a favour. Okay, look, let's make sure that we're not offending people en masse because we might be quite accidentally. <laughs> Almost certainly be, actually. So then the second question relates to, oh, these smartphones, you know, we just live with them. We can't do without them. If you had to wipe everything, all the apps off your phone and only got to keep three, which would you keep? 
So the three that I would keep as a result of that is that I would keep WhatsApp. Uh, I think that's a great communication tool overall in terms yep. of video and text. Uh, something that's amazing. Uh, I would keep YouTube. I think that's a great source of uh, anything. I could probably watch YouTube and, and get around your question and work out how to invent a smartphone by watching enough YouTubes. And then the yep. third would be at the moment LinkedIn. Uh, I think it's a great resource for not necessarily wasting time. That's what YouTube's for, but actually just connecting with peers and thought leadership in terms of everything that's going on. With, with your industry and all business leaders overall, I, I think that that's a great resource that brings a lot of variety of different areas to one place. Uh, and so I would spend my time between those three uh, apps. I'm a bit the same with LinkedIn. And, and also, I'm surprised how few people use YouTube to answer any question they ever have. Mm, like anything, think- like how to do this thing in Excel, how to hang this thing on your wall. Like there's somebody out there has answered everything. Everything. Everything, Probably the biggest thing that people should do in that regard is the moment you pay for the Google subscription, ads are removed. And so it removes the friction around, I've got to watch this 30-second ad before I learn how to fix my toaster. You can just quickly and easily learn how to fix the toaster. So that was the... Uh, the change in my journey that I do use it lots more to learn things and by virtue of paying a small amount each month and you get a lot more for that, um, you then remove the ads, which means you're actually quicker to getting the content overall, Peter. You are and and like really good stuff. So I recently, um, we're all traveling again and I'm speaking at conferences and things like that. And so it's like that one night trip, you know, and you just want to take the carry on. And I've never had a decent carry on. And so my husband for my 50 years, like, let's replace your luggage. Like I found people that all they do is like buy and compare all the different luggage. Like, and they've literally got it there in front of them and they're unzipping the pockets. Like everything you would possibly do in a store, they're doing in front of you. So I just sat, absolutely, you know, with TVs on, end of the evening, and you just watch all these YouTube videos. Like, honestly, I live in YouTube for that stuff. It's just fantastic. Um, Indeed. Well, this podcast will be up on YouTube later today. (laughs) It will be. It will be. Exactly. To that point. All right. So let's dive into Microsoft, shall we? So like I said, you know, we we dove previously into a couple of the sort of core chunky things that people use, being Excel and Word, and you rightfully pointed out to me afterwards that there's just so much there outside of that. Um, And one of the things that I think it's worth us diving into sort of first, only because we're hearing so much about security and cyber and all these sort of risks, is that you know, Microsoft 365, or whichever, whichever package you your business has purchased, has all this inherent security tools in it, you know, and we're probably not taking advantage enough of those. Is that a valid comment? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're not taking advantage of it predominantly because we're not asking the questions of our service providers in terms of turning these features on or yeah. just taking a little bit of time to explore these features, which gives you enough uh, understanding to then uh, be able to coach your support team uh, in terms of IT support. So firstly, when I look at this uh, security and compliance, Office 365, speaking generally, has a is a cloud infrastructure overall. And so yeah. what, that, what that means from my perspective is, as, as we know, everything is not in the cloud. It's just in servers that you don't own, first and foremost, and you're renting those from yeah. Microsoft. And the thing about Microsoft 365 overall is that I kind of tell people that it's like Pentagon grade security, that you don't even understand how strong the security is straight out of the box. So for one yeah. license of E E5, it's something in the order of fifty or fifty-five dollars a month. And you get as good security protection for that one license, really d- that you do for one thousand licenses that a larger provider would have. You just need to know how to turn things on. And yeah. so a couple of things that we've been turning on recently and exploring is what I wanted to share with you. And so mm. the first thing that is really relevant at this point in time is there's training built into Office 365. So if you in the category of uh, email protection, anti-money laundering, phishing tests, etc., there's all this default training that you can turn on and allocate to your users. So right. I can today 
allocate a particular training to all my Office 365 users and that goes to them via email and then they go and have to do that training within the next 14 days, which is really interesting in terms of identifying an issue and then training on it really, really quickly. You get the reports as to whether people had done the training or not. The funny side story to that was that most of my team thought it was spam uh, the (laughs) first time they got the training email. Um, but we've, we, we educated them around that and it is not spam. So doing this training is a great element and you're already paying for it within the, within the same license fee. You don't pay extra for these things. So doing the training is great. Absolutely. And it's all there. They've got expert trainers that have pulled it together. So it's going to be, you know, bouncy ball style, you know, really going to walk you through things. And the thing we always do with that stuff when it's like that team wide, you know, okay, everybody's got to go and watch this thing is we set, say at the end of that two weeks, we set a catch up with the team, maybe only 15 minutes or so, where we just talk through, you know, what surprised them about the training or or what did they learn or like it lets them discuss it. So it's almost like you get the benefit of virtual training with live so that you can then do that discussion and, and shared learning as well. So Correct. we sort of join those two things together. Yeah. And you have to do that in order to get the to get the compounded group learning. Otherwise, yeah. everyone's just in isolation thinking that everyone else knows what you know. Uh, yes. So that's a, so there's a great element of training within there, which which sits under security and compliance. The next level of that I find it really interesting is they have what I call uh, what they call, sorry, attack simulation training. So what mm. you can do within the software is you can set up a phishing email to be sent to all of your users, but it's from you. So I can wow. create an email from, it looks like it's from Advisor Logic with a hyperlink that spells logic differently, but it's got it all in there. And I can send that to all of the users of 365. And so it's, it's creating something that is really close to what hackers will do to us in the future. Okay? Yes. Probably not needing to be really targeted in terms of industries at the moment, but it's really close. If you look at a a large financial planning company, you know which software they use, the hacker can target it in that particular way. So we can do a tax simulation training. And then when you find the users that accidentally clicked on the link, you then are able to train those users through the training that's provided within Office 365. So uh, that is uh, a good element to be learning off the back of in terms of that that simulation training and then teaching off the back of that so and i think that's we all a, learn by doing right like that's correct. The- <laughs> all learn by all learn by our mistakes at Absolutely. the end of the day and so better to learn on my fake phishing email than than anyone else's so i think that that's Definitely. a really good uh, uh element of what you get within 365 uh following the journey of clicking on links that you shouldn't uh, they within the security and compliance settings, they have this thing called safe links. Mm-hmm. So every time that I click on a link for, in an email or in Microsoft Teams, it actually, the link itself, I, I struggle to explain this, but the link itself <laughs> goes through Microsoft before it goes to the actual link that I clicked on. And okay. so therefore Microsoft is doing some checking of that link to make sure that it's a legitimate link going to a source as opposed to uh, a spam. And so it gives me an element of protection that every time we click on a link, it's going through this safe links and they have the same thing for documents as well, that things are checked before the user ends up opening those particular websites. So it's a bit Uh, like a link bouncer. You know, it's your bouncer that's just going to check everybody out as they go through. Absolutely. So they (laughs) they have this element of of checking along the way. And so if you've ever received an email recently from a larger corporate, you might have seen when they hit reply, there's this giant yellow sort of highlighted text where it says, this email originated from outside your organization. Yeah. Do not click on any links in the email without knowing where they're from. That That is a warning, but you, people get so desensitized to that yes. warning. You would you could literally change it one week later and and have it saying whatever you want and no one would read it because they're Correct. already programmed to look past that. It's not an appropriate reminder to to have it on the emails. Why no. that's one step of the process. These extra things of training, testing, testing your staff, and then having built-in safe links just means this 
the, whilst the reminders are there, we know people just look straight past them. And the best yeah. example of that is that if you've ever looked at that ability for people to read with 30 or 40 or 50% of the letters removed from all of the words, and yet they yes. can still read the entire sentence. Yes. So I think we needed to know the letters were there in the first place, uh, but our brain is smart enough to read that entire paragraph without looking at all of those letters. And so yeah. the same example applies for this. If you if you put a message in front of everyone every single day, their brain just ignores it because it's irrelevant. Yeah. yeah. Well, and in your brain you've already read it once. Why would I read right. it again? Why read it again? <laughs> dude, that's inefficient. Like, you know, it's crazy. And it makes a lot of sense. Security is so interesting in those sort of things because you're right. It's almost like we need a a different path every time to sort of force us to use our brains, you know, like to really force us to think. It's like brushing teeth with your left hand if you're right-handed. Exactly. Good luck with that one tonight. I I encourage everyone to try it and see, see how their brain has to work to doing something so simple with the opposite hand. Absolutely. So the next thing in terms of this security and compliance, just to keep on this, uh, keep on this theme, is that Microsoft had built a security score. So everyone loves to keep score in terms of literally anything. And mm. so Microsoft has built a score for your tenant. So just to clarify what that means, your tenant is is the unchangeable name that you choose when you sign up for 365. So right. I specifically say unchangeable because it's really important that it's the one decision that you make when you start to use Office 365 that you cannot change. And so the website URL for us is wealthnetwork.sharepoint. If I spelt Wealth Network wrong the first time, it's a permanent thing that can't be changed without me changing uh, tenants uh, and cancelling and moving. So just a slight aside, but it's really relevant. So when you get a security score for your tenant, then it's looking at your entire licenses in terms of your particular thing. So the wealth network for us. So we've got a few financial planning businesses all within there. And so I get a security score out of a hundred to show me where I'm currently sitting in terms of the score. And then it gives me a list of things to do to increase that score. Okay. So gamifying it. Adding multi-factor authentication, uh, which is a which is a necessary thing. It's not even optional. Mm. It should be necessary. Uh, gets me two points. So I go from fifty to fifty-two by making sure I've got MFA across all all users. And you can go through a series of uh, this. I've, I was looking on my list before today. There's like thirty new things that I can do to improve my score. So yeah. the score goes up when I do those things. But when, when Microsoft in their, in their propeller heads work out new things, my score is going to go down until I a- input those as well. So a score is a great way and a great target mm. to say, guess what? We've actually gone into our settings of Office 365 today. I've looked at my, I've gone to the Defender section, which is the security and compliance, and I've looked at my score and it's 57 out of 100. And you go, great. Now you have a goal of every single month. We want to get that score moving up, not down. And it, and Microsoft will give you a list of activities that you can do to make that a reality. So we don't even, we don't have to do a lot of thinking or executing as part of that. And this is the element of what could you screenshot and send you to your IT company is you could literally just send going, guys, there's 10 things on this list that I think are really important. Microsoft think they're important. They're telling me why haven't we got them in place on our tenant? Yeah. Most of the yeah. time the, the your IT support at that point in time will go, they will say something to the tune of, oh, I didn't know you wanted those on. <laughs> that stuff drives really me great. nuts. And, and yeah. the reality is, is I didn't know, like we're not the specialists in IT, but this happens to small no. businesses. We don't know what yeah. to ask. And so if yeah. you can go to this security and uh, compliance scoreboard, you get to see a list of 10 things. Then you know what to ask your IT. You know? I think I should have these 10 things uh, thing. And then next month you do exactly the same thing. So you've clearly been kept your eye on this for some time. What sort of um, schedule would you have? Like a new habit somebody could put aside 15 minutes would be once a month, once a fortnight. How, how often would you recommend for, say, a principal to do that to sort of get into that habit of keeping an eye on it? Look, I think it would be if you were to do a monthly activity of understanding your score first mm. and foremost and then creating 
a, a thing to do a thing to do weekly or someone else to do weekly in order to improve. I think yeah. if you think about the hours of uh, that we're currently investing in improving our understanding of this technology, yeah. it's just not enough as principles to then be able to instruct other people. So yeah. it's very hard for you to say to IT or anyone in your, even if you've got an internal IT, can you make us more secure, please? It's it's an impossible question to answer <laughs> without yeah. a list of things to do. And so spending a little bit of time, even if you type in security and compliance, Microsoft or the Defender into YouTube and just watch a video produced by Microsoft Mm. about their products that would improve your knowledge in how to do these things so you don't even have there's plenty of people that will record videos that don't even work at microsoft about microsoft products which are which are all quite good as well but if you just stayed within the microsoft community and watched the videos that they produced you're going to be well ahead of the competition in regard in regards to this yeah and look that's a um if you're a Microsoft Office, um, literally, like you use Microsoft in the office, that's a YouTube channel to subscribe to. Like that's one Absolutely. of those ones. There's one for each. Know? There's one for each product, but at least you start with the top one and yeah. work down from there is really, really valuable. So these security and- cores scores are great, Peter, just in terms of that focus. But yeah. secondly, that list of things that you that you need to know uh, is is great from there. So my next thing, yeah, is have you ever lost your laptop? Uh, I haven't, but I've had the moment where I thought I had. Pretty scary. <laughs> it is hor- horrifyingly scary. So, a friend of mine <laughs> lost her laptop and she works for a global investment company and she oh. had someone from America call to uh, about the fact that she lost her laptop because they know everything uh, in yeah. terms of where it is and where it's located. So the 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 thing about this is that we often have things on our laptops that we probably shouldn't. Yeah. Okay. On so on your desktop, if everyone's looking at this now, I got a few things on my desktop. If I'm completely honest, uh, and so we all have stuff on our desktop. And now mine's a physical. Uh, I have a desktop machine, not a laptop, so it's harder for me to lose it. Um, it's just down here next to my knee, and it doesn't go anywhere. But the interesting thing about the additional thing that Microsoft offers is this thing that's called Intune, which is essentially allows you to know and control all of the machines that are in your world so that you can access and re- delete things remotely. Okay. Yeah, so okay. this idea and the question for your IT and working out is go, if I lost my mobile phone, can you remote wipe that so my corporate information is not lost? Yes right. or no? Now, this leads into another interesting thing if you only use one mobile phone is that your employer most likely has enrolled your personal phone into Intune with your with your knowledge but not your understanding. Right. And that means they can wipe that phone remotely if you told them it's lost and you lose all your photos. Yeah. Okay, which is what yeah. most people would be worried about if they, <laughs> yes. they heard that I was going to wipe their phone remotely. And yeah. so a couple of things to unpack in relation to that, Peter, is firstly the idea of business and personal I think is increasing. So the idea of having two devices, uh, I think, is on the on the rise for these mm. type of reasons that your employer controls more things on, frankly, they think it's their device, you think it's your device. So that's an interesting uh, difference. Yep. Uh, but you can op- you, you have to opt into these things as part of your employment. Uh, and so from a, from a business owner's perspective, this means that we can control assets that we own, i.e., um, digital assets and physical computers, laptops and mobile phones and things like that and do things with it if we needed to to protect company data. Yeah. Seems from like all a sorts of things, idea. You know, and it could be like, you know, people working from home and something happens to the house. I mean, you just don't know. <laughs> you can't predict this stuff until after it's happened. That's the thing. Correct. Go, oh, so it's not dang, foolproof never... in terms no. of – it's not foolproof in terms of you have this program and therefore all of your data is safe because – and no. we'll get on to SharePoint versus OneDrive in a, in a second. Uh, but it, it gives an extra layer of protection. So things that are on my desktop right now, if someone took the hard drive and put it into another computer, they could pretty well see what's on my desktop. But they can't yeah. see what's in the cloud. No. Okay? The moment that no. computer opened and connected to the internet – in tune can re- remote wipe it. Things like yeah. your mobile phone is actually always connected to the internet, 
um, through 5G. So you can remote wipe your mobile phone and things like that. So it yeah. has implications because find my iPhone doesn't work if you just remote wiped it um, and things like that. So it's got to yeah. be thought through. But I think being aware of this protection that business owners can have around the assets that they've probably bought and paid for and maintain yep. is really important. And it's it, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's, sometimes it's the smallest thing that can help. I mean, even the little tags. So Apple have got their tags that you can um, you can put on your luggage and things like that. Mm. And people go, oh, really? You know, I mean, if your luggage is lost, it's lost. Well, I've had a friend who went to the UK after, just after lockdown when it was still all very pear-shaped. And they had a whole lot of problems with their um, baggage handlers, I think. So it was just like it was a good chance your luggage was going to get lost. Like it was just Heathrow was a disaster, right? And so – and she was one of those people, that awful feeling, you know, when you're standing at the carousel and there's just nothing everybody else has got their bags and you're on your own like it's just horrendous but she had one of those tags and she could actually show the guy at security and go I can tell you where it is and he literally went in opened the door into all the crazy baggage area saw it had fallen off one of the things and grabbed it for you you know like Mm, these little mm. things that can just empower you to take action that's what all this is doing is it lets you respond to a situation Right. Correct. So that's a that's a that's another good feature to to think about in terms of the little tiles or the little iPhone yeah. things to find define your assets and it and this is an important thing to for for everyone to remember is that you're using company assets and so yeah and you're employed so there'll be this whole thing about going well I don't want my employer to know where I am but you're actually holding an a employer's asset in your hand handling yeah. client yeah. personal information so there is an element where your employer should know where you are and those kind of things. Which brings me on another really interesting thing about security and compliance is that you can lock down your Office 365 tenant so it can only be accessed by computers that are in Australia. Right. So that's an interesting element as well. Yeah, okay. If if someone from the UK was trying to log into my uh, Office 365 right now, they wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. So it provides a level of security on top of any normal security. There's a location-based rules that you can set, yeah, uh, okay. which is quite interesting. Uh, it's not Russian hackers uh, are frankly going to be able to get around that. So it's sure. not once again the the only solution that you need to put in place. Uh, but it's just these building these brick walls of different levels of protections. Yeah, for sure. So then like a number of those things, it sounds like though, you know, you've got to invest the time to either turn them on or be aware of them or be checking them or sitting them up. You know, there's a lot of layers there um, of what you've got to lean into. And I agree, you know, one place to start could just be watching some Microsoft YouTube videos on this stuff. Like just start to understand um, is clearly a starting point. But there's so much more to Microsoft. So you mentioned SharePoint versus OneDrive. I feel like as somebody who isn't a Microsoft person anymore, right? We're not in Microsoft, but I feel like SharePoint and OneDrive are one of the, are one of those things that everybody knows the name of and they sort of have a vague sense of what they do, but they really don't fully understand them. Would yep. you agree that's the case? Because that's what yeah, it feels absolutely. like from the outside. I think lots of people use the names interchangeably as well. Okay. So I'm happy to happy to share a couple of our learnings in in relation to this so Mm. we've used sharepoint for probably like seven years in terms of the storage of our data and so sharepoint does a couple of things so sharepoint uh if you go back to old corporate was like the internet and everyone Mm. went you went oh check it on sharepoint because it was an internal web page that people went to go to to read a process or something like that right and it is that today as well. The difference is it looks like the internet. So if you went to someone in the 2000s and they're like, oh, yeah, I've got SharePoint, it's a process library, it looked ugly. Yeah. And looking ugly means people don't read. Yeah. So we've learnt, we've learned that as we've built Instagram. So the reality <laughs> is that we need uh, SharePoint is an intranet or process library. We've got one internally and it's as beautiful as a website. It's only yep. accessible by people that are within our tenancy. Okay, yep. that have Office 365 licenses. So that locks down the information as well to yep. one logon, which I'll keep, we'll kind of keep comparing to how many different logons Peter has yeah. for all of her tech stack. Yeah, so yeah, for sure. SharePoint has one logon, which means that you're accessing your intranet, 
The second part of what SharePoint is, it is a document storage location yep. in exactly the, in very similar circumstances to, to what Google Drive is, Dropbox, and OneDrive. Yeah. Okay. So okay. in terms of I've got a Word document and I want to save it somewhere in the cloud, I have a lot of different choices. I can save it in SharePoint, which is very easy to do. I can save it in OneDrive, which is easy to do. Save it in Dropbox and I can save it in Google Drive. Okay, mm. we'll, we'll stop talking about Google Drive, but we'll look at the other three examples. Mm. So why do I want to save it into SharePoint is when it's saved into SharePoint, in my view, there's only one file which is in the cloud. Right. Okay, there's one version and it's there. You have ridiculously long version control from that file in that if you've got a Word document been working on for the last three years, you can go back to almost every single version over the last three years. Yeah, okay. We just had to decrease ours from down to 300 versions because we were taking up too much space on the, right. on the, on the server. Yep. Uh, and space is, you pay for space at the end of the yep. day on all of them. But so that was an interesting thing. So A, SharePoint has a lot of version controls. It's in the cloud. There's only one version. It's not on, mach- it's not on local machines. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you can do with SharePoint that you can't do with OneDrive is you can create metadata attached to the file to be able to do interesting things over time. So what I mean by that, so everyone knows and understands Instagram mm-hmm. and hashtags. Mm. So if I want to look at sunsets, I just go and look at hashtag sunsets and Instagram will serve me up a ridiculous amount of sunsets. In the same vein, you can attach hashtag driver's license to every driver's license you've saved in SharePoint and then you can just ask SharePoint to show you the driver's licenses of your entire client book. Okay. Okay. So whilst these features are there, not everyone uses it to the maximum, but you can see over time you, how this could be more powerful than just naming files in your traditional way of date, comma, what it is, comma, surname. So instead yeah. of having that in all one thing, what we've got now is we've got the date separated from the, the what the document is, from the client name, from the document type. And so those things become searchable and manageable over time through SharePoint. And just to clarify that point, because I think, and this could be a our gen thing rather than a younger gen, but for lots of people, the way they think about saving files is very, you know, folder, subfolder, subfolder, sub, like that's the old school way, right? And, And they could only work that way, which meant really a document could only live in, in one group or one, you know, one grouping. Whereas what, tags or hashtags or whatever, like any of these things let you do is it it can be the one document, but it can be li- live in 47 different groups. And that's Correct. really powerful. That overlapping where you can tag it with all sorts of things. Tagging is one of the most underused, but most powerful things you can have, whether it's documents or your CRM or any of these things. It just lets yep. things live in multiple groups. And so it's a really 100%. clever way to make things accessible. Indeed. And so SharePoint has that. So that's the mm-hmm. element. So you, SharePoint will have the traditional folder structure of client name, click on fact find, click on bank statements, and there the bank statement will be. But the moment yeah. you do hashtag bank statement and the client name, you can search for that in a different way and have different views and filters over the, over the top of it. So nice. there's that element uh, in terms of SharePoint. The other things in relation to SharePoint is you can still share folders with third parties, you can share files with third parties, and you can control the security and access of those files, okay, which is a similarity as we go down. If I contrast that to OneDrive and Dropbox as two Mm. um, kind of competitors, the danger, my, my danger with OneDrive is, A, you don't have all that extra features. Yep. And the second thing with OneDrive is that, whilst this can be turned off, most people sync it with their computer Mm. and so therefore it's on their Explorer on their laptops. Yeah. So the if you go into Windows Explorer, you got that thing on the left or whatever the Apple ones thing, you got all your files there on the left. If you've got OneDrive on there, most likely things are syncing with your physical computer at home. And so what that means is that you have two copies of the file, one in the cloud, one on your computer. Now, it's often a criticism in the past that you had syncing issues. I think that's a 
criticism of the past and it doesn't really happen anymore. But what the issue is, at the moment you lose that laptop, those files that were syncing on your machine are actually on your machine. Yeah. And so taking the hard drive out and putting it into another laptop, all of those files will be seen. And so the the feature needs to be turned off so that you're not accessing files that are saved on your computer. You're simply seeing them through Explorer if you want to. Yeah. But the better thing is to see them through your browser. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the it is an interesting is a much stronger way to access all of these files. Yeah, and it's it is something that's going to take time for the staff to get out of the habit of. You know, they'll like the fact that it's, you know, it's local and I feel like it's easy and and isn't this better and and like you say, syncing used to be a problem. To be honest, it can still be a problem in terms of using data, like your your upload or downloads, depending on where you're at. And you'll find why is everything slowed down? It's like it's because it's syncing. Like mm, <laughs> correct. Some yep. or somebody's moved a whole folder, you know, in the setup, and suddenly everybody's syncing a whole lot of data and things like that. So it's it's messy. It's just mm, a messy absolutely, setup. Absolutely. And let's talk about your down because you mentioned downloads. It remind me of an interesting thing of your downloads folder. So. The reality is that if everyone went to their downloads folder today, they would have a lot of content in there that they shouldn't. So yeah. a few years ago, we used to make, uh, we used to get a screenshot on Friday of all of our staff's computers, which was the desktop and the downloads folder to make sure that they were empty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, we created that policy for our staff, go to the managing director, you go look at his downloads folder He's not complying. So there is an <laughs> yes. element of getting everyone to comply. I understand the, the skill set of computers have moved on that you can actually write a script definitely for Windows. This is beyond my pay grade, but you can write scripts to delete your deleted items every single Friday. And if you didn't yep. save it or move it, too bad. you got to yep. get into the habit of moving stuff out of your deleted items and deleting it over, overall. So, yep. um, yeah, so that's the... The syncing, I think, is the issue. Uh, and then the second issue between it, when we go over to our friends at Dropbox is that whilst they whilst they can have as good a product as Microsoft, why pay for two? Yeah, it's, this is the element that I'm getting to. Why pay for two? Why have two logons? Why have your data in two different locations? Yep. I completely agree. And look, there's so many other things in Microsoft that are the same. Teams and Zoom. Why why are people paying for Zoom? When I, don't, got teams? I don't I don't, I don't get know. It. Whilst um yeah. I, I think if you've ever I did a post on LinkedIn a while ago, which we can find in the for the show notes, but if anyone and this was not me, but someone took the time to read the terms and conditions of Zoom's updated video recording policy. Yes. And essentially it allowed for the for the training of their AI bot of every single recorded phone call through Zoom. So yeah. if you can imagine that right now, Peter, that we had the idea for the next Uber of financial services and we were discussing it through Zoom and Zoom was listening to that and then took our idea and actually executed on it faster. Yeah, Theoretically, that's possible within their terms and conditions and yeah. we would have no say in changing that. So Correct. Once again, you've got to think about the uh, the participation of third parties in terms of your data. Now, would Microsoft do that? Um, I, I would pretty well say fundamentally no. You're happy to do your own research into that. Microsoft, in terms of their partnership with um, Chat GTP and um, I, the, whatever the head company is called, the they've signed on to sort of an AI charter. And so you yes. can go and read that AI charter in terms of what they're committing to and confirming that they won't do. And things yeah. like what Zoom are doing, as the example, just doesn't sit well with in terms of my values as a company yeah. to opt into those kind of things directly. Now, I've opted into lots of giving of personal data over the years, but we've got to start to think about this slightly differently when we're making these bigger bigger decisions. So Yeah, absolutely. That's the journey of SharePoint and data data storage overall. So I think Share I would be saying that SharePoint is the way to go overall uh within within this environment. And what's interesting about this too is um you know there's always that debate oh but you know we could get these other apps and you can all 
bundle it together. And look, I, I get it. I'm, you know, I'm interviewing people every week on all these new tools. But the thing is when a provider is an expert in that thing. So Microsoft is an expert in a number of things here, and this is one of them. SharePoint mm. is one of the things they do and invest a lot in. Then why would you go elsewhere for that? You Correct. know, if you're in the Microsoft suite, that like if that's where you live, then it's just not going to make a lot of sense to go outside of that. Yeah, it's when people, they're doing something that's on a fringe that somebody else name you know nails. Mm. You know, that's different. That's very yeah, I, different. Canva I, would be an interesting debate for me. So. You know, are, are they going yeah, to be able to keep not, up with I'm Canva? Not, we're not going to go right? in through this today, but can, um, Microsoft already has this thing called Clip Champ, which is the video yep. editing software. They already have AI generating image software, and they already have a paint based thing that's in the cloud that it will AI generate stuff like Canva. So, whilst I think yeah. Canva's on the run at the moment, I, I, my saying with all of this, Peter, is always just wait for Microsoft to do it. And so <laughs> yes. whilst you can pay 20 bucks a month for Canva right now, there's a good chance in six months you'll be going, actually, Microsoft can oh. do it pretty well. Yeah. And the yeah. getting ready for that world is there's two things. So, the, so we're on the uh, verge tonight of the global release of Copilot from Microsoft for the world. Uh, yes. So there's been yes. some lucky large companies that are been trialing this for a period of time. And if you don't know what it is, a quick Google and YouTube will get you ready for it. Uh, but mm-hmm. by the time you're listening to that, I will be uh, trialing Copilot in all of my programs. And so that means it's an AI engine that is within Microsoft, which is reading every email I've ever written, reading every spreadsheet I've ever written, reading every Word document that's ever been written by my entire company since the formation of my tenant, so seven years, to help not only me but my entire team be better. And so yeah. going back to the AI charter, it's only reviewing my data. My data is not going outside of my tenant as a result of this, yeah. but I have this AI engine built into every single program that I will be using as of tomorrow or for the listener yeah. as of now. And <laughs> I got people ready for this fact by recently doing a video on on you on LinkedIn about how I was asking uh, Chat GT, sorry, Copilot for Edge, and we'll talk about Edge in a moment. But I was yeah. asking it to read an Australian Super PDS and tell me the fees and give me an insurance quote. Yeah, and it did. And that's both the of those interesting. Things. Right. That's that's the interesting thing. I mean, for somebody like me, so I've written two books for the public, right? Really simple financial literacy sort of stuff. But to be able to feed those things <laughs> into a tool like this and then say, okay, I need a hundred uh LinkedIn posts on that, please. Yep. Right. Like like this is for things you've already done, right? This is work you've already done, efforts you've already taken extract, you know, and, and get more information. Um, it's just going to be incredible. What yeah, we we do. yeah, absolutely. And we don't know the scale of how amazing this could be, but it comes back to my point of if you can keep everything in house, imagine how good it's going to be. So this idea yes. that I have a meeting with a client, I, which this, this is not future truth, this exists now. You have a meeting with a client, you record it through Teams Premium, which is 10 yep. bucks. It will do recap, which is an AI-generated meeting summary and um, AI-generated action items. So it already does mm-hmm. that. Then when you're going to write an email to the client in Microsoft and you type dear client name, it is about to prompt you going, "Is do you want to write a summary of the client meeting that you just had to the client? And you say yes, and it will put the summary into your email. You yeah. can even then ask it to make it more concise if you would like to, and it will shorten it. So yeah. this is the um, the message that I have around just committing to this particular technology. If we think this is going to be good, we've got to start to work out how we get things back into the fold, not continue to connect things that are out outside. Yeah, um, yeah. To that end, I'm curious in something like Teams, which I'm betting you guys you sort of use a lot, then are you using things like Microsoft Whiteboard as part of that? Like are you guys using tools like that in terms of, you know, drawing uh, something for a mo- client? So, I, so what I do now is actually I don't use Whiteboard, but I use OneNote yep. to draw with my only Apple product. <laughs> uh, for the listener, I was holding up my Apple Pen. Uh, Pen so yeah. I run 
OneNote on my iPad, which I can share on the screens and things like that. And so we yeah. use that okay. versus um, whilst Whiteboard is good, it doesn't have anything else around it at the moment. Right. Future, obviously, it could easily quickly save it into SharePoint uh, on the client file mm. without me having to think about it. Uh, but, mm. yeah, we've been using Teams for for um, a long time. I was on the beta of it and whenever that was pre, well, pre, pre-COVID and <laughs> It's got a lot better because yep. it just copied the features of all the other video conferencing things right. that were not uh, covered under intellectual property. So you can do most things in uh, Teams now that you could do in the competitor products. Yep. And my view is that if it doesn't do the one thing that you're complaining about, that one thing is actually not as important as what you think that it is. Yeah. And particularly as I would argue – um, for almost everybody listening, they're just not using all the other things that are possible within these tools anyway. So Correct. focusing yeah. on this one feature, like that's great, but why don't let's bother to make sure we are using the living daylights out of these tools. Like yeah. make sure you've learned every feature possible and are constantly up to date on them because you'll probably get as much bang for buck out of that than that one thing you wish it did. Correct. And um, that's the, and so many people the, out there the have last- worked out how to hack that stuff anyway, you know? Indeed, indeed, yeah. And look, the last thing that I'd, I want to circle out in terms of programs to use that I think is really beneficial is actually, uh, it's called Edge. So you yep. and I go back a long time, Peter, in terms of our technological journey. And so yep. everyone remembers that, everyone in our age remembers that Microsoft got sued maybe in the 2000s by Netscape, I think, in terms of bundling yeah. products together. So Microsoft bundled their browser, which was called... Oh. I don't know. Oh, goodness. In, oh, just Internet Explorer. Yeah, so Microsoft bundled yeah, 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 yeah. Internet Explorer with their uh, their Windows operating system, got a bit in trouble for that. So, But yeah. the future's moved forward and now they're bundling Edge with their um with their windows products now edge is built on top of chrome or chromium right so chromium is open source software which is the chrome browser that google wrote a program over the top of microsoft edge essentially is is a, a skinned version of chromium okay okay so the the core operating of edge and the core operating of google chrome is exactly the same so all yeah. of your little plugins that work in Google, they all work in Edge. It looks and feels really, really similar to to Google Chrome. Yep. The reason why you move across is that everything is syncing in your browser then in terms of what's going on in terms of your work tenancy. So right. I get a I get a data feed, like a LinkedIn scrolling feed of all the things that are going on in my company every constantly, actually, not even every day. So documents that I have access to, I can see that people are editing. Meetings yep. that have been recorded that I was invited to that I didn't attend, I can watch the recap. Meetings that I did attend, I can watch the recap. Reminders from my emails. So a client sends me an email saying, oh, Dean, can you do this? I forgot about it. It'll come up in my data feed saying, did you do this? Right all within the Edge browser. And, yeah, yeah, sure, you can go on to Sydney Morning Herald website as well. It does all of the normal browsing. Uh, yeah. But uh, from that perspective, uh, it's pretty powerful. The thing that they did as a result of that as well is they created this business and personal licensing of, of, of Edge. So you can actually have a personal account of Edge and a business account of Edge, and they're kept separate. So okay. this idea that people have one device is really common in computing. So you can go onto your personal browser if you want to look at Facebook uh, yep. and you can go on your business browser to, to do everything else and it's smart enough to learn over time where you want to open up certain things. Right, right, perfect. And so once again, it's all happening within this ecosystem. Then, you know, with the introduction of things like Copilot, then all of this is just going to completely streamline the way that, you know, you can all work because it's all interconnected. Uh, and absolutely. there's, absolutely, you know, delegation without even having to delegate is where we all need to head, right? It's where this, you don't have to physically sit down with somebody and hand something over. It's all can automatically happen. That's where this power really sits, you know, when you can really get that humming. And you're right, if you haven't 
invested the time to understand all these elements, you're not going to be getting the real V8 superpower. You know, it's just not going to be yep. happening uh, for the practice. And everything I've mentioned is included in the, I feel like I work for Microsoft. Everything I've mentioned <laughs> today is included in the one low price of 55 bucks <laughs> a month or $30 a month. It's ridiculously, uh, I'm not going to say cheap. It's great value for money. What yes. you pay for and what you get as a result, if you continue to leverage uh, it, it. All of these extra things are pretty well uh, complementary as part of being within the Microsoft, except for Copilot. That's going to double my cost to 30 bucks a month. Uh, but yeah. I think I would be able to get $30 of value from this uh, program within the first two hours of using it. A hundred percent. And look, you know, we're here, it's actually, we're recording this on Halloween, folks. So we're here on the eve. I think it's quite funny that this is the eve of, of when Hallow's Eve is when they're, um, you know, next going to launch Copilot. I think that's hysterical. Um, but, you know, and don't worry, folks, we're actually going to get um, a Microsoft certified expert to talk about Copilot, hopefully in the next few weeks. I'm still trying to tee that up because I think it's so, so important that we get, yes, you can play with ChatGPT. We're all doing that, but to understand how it can impact our everyday productivity, you know, this stuff that we can do, it'll be immeasurable the way it will change how you can work. So look, keep your ears uh, ears peeled for that one. I feel like we've covered a lot. Is there anything else you wanted to add in? But I feel like we've look, hit the highlights. No, I, actually, it's a good reminder. I'm taking the kids down the street for a uh, trick-or-treat uh, in a couple of moments. So the, yeah, I Perfect. think I got a great story from, uh, I was in a conference once and, and, the question was, do you like do you like X plan was raised to the entire audience and one person put their hand up who happened to be sitting next to me. I said, Well, why do you like X plan the most? And he, he his statement was that was that he maximized his use of the software. So instead right. of anything else, he's like, just gonna learn how to do X plan. To be the best in the world at X Plan was his goal at the business level. And so it was just this realization that he loved it because he put effort into it. And that's the message I love to leave for the listener is that I think you'll grow, you can grow to love this because if you put effort into it, you'll actually see all the variety of things that are available to you that are part of the suite already. And you, you'll feel more confident in terms of security. You'll feel that you can leverage uh, different pieces of the software over time. And I think the combination of those two things just has you really well placed for the next phase of this technological revolution. Better to be kind of near the front uh, as they invent fire for the fourth time as opposed (laughs) to being at the back going, I still have, and I quote, physical files in my office in a file room. So if you're someone that this is a huge jump, but, but there is an element of working towards removing the file room from your office uh, and moving yeah. up into this newer technology. So that's a long journey, but it's an important journey. But embracing this at the front end through improving your own understanding and all Peter and I are asking you to do is watch YouTube um, yeah. instead of Netflix and you will actually grow your understanding of these things within a couple of weeks. Absolutely. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about anything that we've chatted about, then um, we'll include Dean's LinkedIn details um, in the show notes. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure he'd be happy to point you in the right direction um, and even, you know, maybe co- have a conversation uh, with him about the Wealth Network. You never know uh, where the right match might be for your business. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today and just blowing all of our minds about what's in Microsoft and what we're already paying for in Microsoft. So, you know, let's get some real value. So thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. See you next time. So I'm assuming that you, the listener, are almost certainly a Microsoft user. Most people are, most businesses are. Um, And so I'd be keen to understand how much of what Dean was covering you've been aware of, you know, whether that's something that you've never looked at before, maybe in your practice, somebody else is responsible for that and you hadn't heard much about it. You know, it absolutely would encourage you to get on the Ensemble community platform and share uh, your experiences here because, you know, Microsoft is this big bat we have in our toolkit that many of us are just not using well enough. It's got some heft, it's got some weight, and we should be utilizing it better. In terms of my thoughts here 
I do think I sort of wanted to direct some some encouragement towards any of you listening that are employees in the business you're in. So you're not the principal, um, you're an employee. And perhaps you're thinking, well, Peter, it's not really my, you know, area to worry about things like Microsoft Defender and what we're doing on those, you know, those fronts. The thing is, um, you know, not everybody is going to be aware of it. Your principal maybe isn't as tech savvy as you are. So I'd give you a couple of to-dos. The first thing I'd do is find a Microsoft YouTube channel and check out, you know, some videos on Microsoft Defender and understand what's there. Um, and understand how easy it can be to turn some of this stuff on and why you should. And then go to um, your principal and just talk to them about it and say, hey, I listened to the podcast, I've done a big bit of digging. Hey, this could make a difference to um, how protected our clients are, how protected the business is. You know, is there something that I can assist with or can point you in the right direction of? Um, we all play a part here, you know, and and um, the key, as, as Fraser, Fraser Jack has highlighted for us in our Cyber Collective episode, you know, the human beings are what play a part in this. The human beings turn features on that can protect us. They undertake appropriate behaviors that can protect us. So, you know, each of us has a role we can play to really contribute to this. So I really would encourage you to do your own digging, understand better for yourself. And invariably you'll learn something that can add value in your own life, let alone what you can then assist um, the business with. So absolutely head out and see how you go. If you would like to, you know, uh, chat to some peers about how you might bring it up, if you're not sure how to bring it up with your principal, then once again, head onto the community platform, the Ensemble online platform and, and ask the question, look, I've done this digging. I'd love to have this chat with the principal. I'm not sure how to approach it. Anybody got any suggestions? Like that's what the platform is for. You know, we're all here so that we can help each other um, tackle whatever challenges we're facing. So I really would encourage you to ask for help you know, and, and somebody will have already been there. They've already gone through it and, and they might even suggest something to prepare beforehand or, or make sure you can answer this question or, you know, all that sort of thing that'll just get you better ready to have that conversation. Now, as you know, there is only one skill we need to become bionic advisors and that is avid curiosity. And to help you build that habit, today's Curiosity Corner website that I wanted to take a look at is called TripIt. You can find it at tripit.com. That's T R I P I T dot com. This is basically your travel coordinator app, right? So anytime you make a booking, it could be a flight. And of course, hopefully, more of us are doing that. I literally came away from a long weekend recently myself to the beautiful Wit Sundays. Um, and so we're going to be booking more accommodation. We're going to be booking um, more flights. What TripIt lets you do is any confirmations you get, uh, confirmation emails, you can just forward it to a TripIt address and it's going to sort of set up your your travel itinerary for you. It's going to have all those details. It's going to keep you updated. Um, it's going to have little alerts and reminders so that you don't miss things. Uh, it's going to let you know that there's a gate change for that flight. All these sort of things that might be across a few different um, apps or tools you might have, then, you know, this can be all in the one place. And if you go as far as getting the pro version of the tool, then, you know, it'll let you track the seats you're in. It'll it'll give you a check-in reminder. You know, it'll give you point tracker. It lets you share an itinerary with certain, it might be family members, or it might even be, you know, colleagues or somebody that you work with to make sure they know um, what dates you've got, what things. Um, and it can even host, you know, travel documentation, all sorts of stuff you might need on the go. So it's just an example of um, giving you all of the information in one place for a specific need. Uh, and often, particularly when you travel overseas, you're probably being careful on what data you're using. There's only certain apps you want to use data for, you know, all those sort of things. Then by having all of this in one place might just be a way to make that easier for you. So um, check it out. Let me know what you think as always, or if you maybe you're an expert and you're like, Peter, I've got this nailed. Let me share with you all the ways that I use TripIt. Then I would love to hear that um, and hear about how well it's worked for you and, you know, has it given you directions while you're on a massive airport, anything like that, that it's helped, I would love to hear about. Welp, 
That's all we've got for this week, folks. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice, tech fix, automatically sent to you each Friday. And look, if you're getting tech overwhelm and you sort of wonder if you need to streamline rather than take on more apps in your business, then please just give your dealer group a nudge to reach out to me as I've been doing some sessions and workshops around this sort of paradox of advice tech abundance and its potential drawbacks, you know, and perhaps how advice tech minimalism might work for you and the habits you can build to keep your advice process humming from a tip tech perspective. And I even do some sessions on how we can position our businesses to be best positioned to take, (laughs) position twice, to take advantage of this sort of AI tsunami that's going to be coming down the track. You know, there's a whole lot of habits and things you can do. Dean mentioned some of them um, that you can put in place in your business such that as these opportunities come, you're well placed to work out if they can add value in your business, in your process. So if you're curious about any of that, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T. T-A-N-D, and we can absolutely have a chat. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. Stay curious.